In this year's general election, voters can choose one of four candidates running for governor. Three of those candidates are trying to unseat Democratic incumbent David Ige, who declined our invitation to appear with his opponents. But Republican State Representative Andrea Tupola, Green Party candidate Jim Brewer, and nonpartisan candidate Terence Teruya accepted. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. The general election is a little more than six weeks away. The primary election narrowed the field of candidates, but there are still a lot of final decisions to be made, including who will lead our state for the next four years. Governor David Ige's campaign told us he was unavailable due to a scheduling conflict, but all three of his challengers are here to discuss the issues. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Our volunteers from PBS Hawaii Family and Friends are standing by. You can see them there to take your calls. Please keep them busy. Now to our guest. Terence Teruya is running as a nonpartisan candidate. He has worked at the bus for 26 years and at the Honolulu Police Department for 16, doing both jobs full time. He currently works at the bus and the Board of Water Supply. Jim Brewer is the nominee for the Green Party. He lives in Honolulu and describes his occupation as a quest for human unity activist. He's also a longtime Alelo producer. And Andrea Topola is the Republican nominee for governor. She's the State House Minority Leader and representative for District 43, which stretches from Eva to Maili. She was first elected in 2014. Prior to that, she taught music at Leeward Community College. Let's start off uh, just to get to know uh, Terrence and Jim a little bit because uh, I'm sure a lot of the questions will end up being for uh, Republican candidate Andrew Topola. But uh, Terrence, you work a lot of jobs. Uh, what has that done to frame your political philosophy? What is your political philosophy? Well, unfortunately, uh, working so many jobs, you kind of lose touch with politics because you feel that everything is going to be taken care of. And unfortunately, it has not. So I'm very upset. And I keep on listening for the answers, but unfortunately, I haven't heard the correct answers. Um, unfortunately, I've, I've filed papers already, but looking at Andrea, I, I thought that she's so outgoing and get things done, I probably wouldn't have pulled papers if I knew that she was running. Well, an endorsement right here from a <laughs> candidate running against you. That's a pretty good start for you. Thank you. <laughs> Jim Brewer, uh, you've been a candidate many, many times. What makes you keep running, and what do you stand for? What does the Green Party in particular stand for for you? Well, uh, the Green Party, are, we're defenders of democracy, protectors of the planet, patriots for peace, and activists for shared prosperity. And my background is that um, I uh, served uh, in the U.S. Navy. My last uh, ship was the USS Kamehameha. 1969. It was a fleet ballistic missile submarine with all the nuclear missiles. My job was to make sure that uh, we we're exactly where we were supposed to be in the navigation department so that when those missiles were fired, they would land exactly where they were supposed to. And how does that, what does that mean for you politically? What, what, do you, what would you hope to change in Hawaii? Well, what it did for me was it made me think about every time we went to battle stations, and that is the, the drills that you do every week. Uh, maybe every day, but the point is that every time you go to battle stations, you and everybody on that uh, ship has decided that you're going to probably participate in the destruction of the world. And so what I did uh, was I got out prematurely after 12 and a half years and became a peace activist. Oh. And I've been doing that for 42 years. So, Andrew Topola, you're here without having to face your, without your, uh, your primary uh, opponent here. How does it feel? Um, are you comfortable with the situation in terms of being recognized as a candidate out there? As a, I mean, it seems like they might be taking you for granted. Well, I think that, you know, going across the state didn't just start when I ran for governor. Being in the legislature and serving on eight different committees, in order to really understand when you're on the education committee or the higher ed, you go to all of these places. When I served on the public safety committee, I visited all the prisons and jails. And so I think this has been, over time, getting to know some of these issues. And as well, now that I'm running for governor, letting people know, as the leader of the state, I would, and then give them the policy proposal of what we need to do. 
How do people, given this atmosphere of hyper-partisanship, how do people respond to you as a Republican candidate? Because you haven't hidden from that. I mean, you're running as a Republican. Yes, I think that a lot of people have questions, and I think broadly across the state, there has been a lot of concern about just what are the different parties? Because a lot of people who aren't partisan at all want to know what does it mean to be a Democrat? What does it mean to be a Republican? I would say the large amount of people that I've spoken to across the state just want to know if somebody cares about them or even knows what's going on in their neighborhood park or what's been going on with homelessness or even in their schools and how dilapidated some of the back repairs have been getting. Um, let's talk a little bit about the cost of living. That's a really big issue. Um, Terrence, uh, Turia, you brought it up. Uh, what do you think needs to be done to reduce the cost of living in Hawaii? Well, currently right now, everything is really at uh, all-time highs. And the only thing that I can see right now to help give immediate release uh, relief is probably um, don't tax uh, unprepared food and prescription drugs. Um, but then there's a lot of things that play into our economy as the cost of housing, unfunded pension liabilities. Um, for a state this small, we have so many problems and it all boils down to it seems like what everyone has in common is that we don't have the money. So with all the money that they say they lack, but with all the taxes they receive, there seems to be some kind of imbalance here. So because I believe in structured problem solving, that means everything has to have an order. Because if you don't know where you are, that means you're lost. If you don't know where you've been, you go around in circles. So everything needs to be structured correctly so that when things get accomplished, you can check them off your list and move on until you finally fix the problem. Yeah, Jim Brewer, um, in terms of the Green Party, you, you hear a lot about the social services, uh, environmental policy, and so on. That all costs money. Do you think that that's something that could be done and still keep the cost of living under control or try and control the cost of living? Well, I think that uh, the cost of living has to do with the uh, economy of the United States. I mean, Wall Street and uh, to a great extent, the big boys on Bishop Street is what I call them. Uh, they basically, uh, as a matter of fact, you talk about we uh, an all-time high. We're at an all-time high of people who have to have two jobs. Um, you know, it's supposed to be a great thing that we have full, uh, the fullest, un, uh, unempl uh, fullest employment in the, in the country. But the thing is, that it's because everybody uh, has a low paying job. And uh, so we have to think about, uh, we see people making uh, like um, Zuckerberg, for instance. I mean, this young kid, all of a sudden, he's worth billions of dollars, oh, trillions. Chunk of Kauai, right? I think, yeah. Well, and the thing is that uh, uh, everything is out of whack, and and this is, you know, the times we're in right now are very reminiscent to the uh, Great Depression. Do you think, Andrew Topoli, do you think that we're in that dire strait? Oh yes. Absolutely. I don't think I'd be 37 years old running for governor if I didn't think that this was super important. I think the same you know, comments that Terrence had is when you look left, you look right, you don't see the kind of leaders that you want to follow. You've got to become that leader. When we talk about cost of living, I mean, we are getting priced out of the market. We are getting pushed out of our homes. And I think when people, of course, think about cost of living, the most the biggest chunk of your paycheck goes to your mortgage or to your rent. So if we don't start to tackle these affordable housing issues or maybe even illegal vacation rentals or other things that are eating up the market like outside investors, we're continuously going to be losing our housing market. What, what do you see doing about, let, let's start with, there's several things you brought up. What, let's start with overseas investors. I mean, right now um, there's a constitutional amendment that will be voted on that basically tries to tax residential uh, investment property. There's a lot of talk about targeting um, offshore investors. What do you think should be done to discourage that offshore investment without harming the business cycle? Well, you have to define it. I think when we had this conversation about the constitutional amendment, in order to tax investment properties but not have a definition of the word investment property, because as you know, some of the investment properties are housing local businesses, are providing local rentals. So making sure that we craft legislation that is going to target outside entities and not hurt our own rentals or our own local families. How would you do that, though? How would you target? Well, I think we'd have to, if we're talking about property taxes, then we would have to work with the counties because the state currently does not do 
do property taxation. And so in order for us to utilize the department that already exists and find a way to tax them, we would have to figure out within each of the counties if they'd be amenable towards this and then how within their counties. And I think starting with, you know, vacation rentals would be a good place because 80% and we've looked this up because we've had so many vacation rental bills, about 80% of the TVUs or transit vacation units are from outside investors. And that's just an address that's pretty easy to identify. You know, in other um, places, they've had, and I'll put this out to all three of you, uh, in other places, uh, they just have a simple surcharge on an investor who comes in from offshore. Literally, um, they'll say, okay, if you're going to buy a $3 million unit and you don't live here you're, you're, and you're not going to be an owner-occupant, we will surcharge that transaction 30% one time, keep the money. Does something like that work for you in terms of a choice that's a little bit more targeted? I mean, I think it, it essentially could, could be one. I think that other countries have even toyed with no outside investors. New Zealand actually was just recently part of that conversation. So people have asked me that in the real estate market as well, is how do we help more local families first and foremost? Go ahead. Yes, because I've been a <coughs> realtor associate, uh, I know a little bit about that. They do have taxes already on people who don't live here. It's a harp to tax. And when foreigners buy homes here and when it's time to sell, they also get what they call a FERPTA tax that's added on. Now, to is me, that a local tax or is that a federal tax? No, that's uh, the, uh, the HARPTA is the local tax. Um, it's been a while since I've been in the market, but the reason why a lot of people say, hey, we have a lot of land, and the reason why I first got my real estate license and worked with a realtor is because I thought I would be making a lot of money. But when you go in that business and you find out how hard and how tough it is to sell a home from staging it, making it all ready to sell, it's, it's, a, it's a really tough business and it takes up your whole weekend to prep the house and get it ready. And the reason why people think we have a lot of land to sell is because... Probably the not going to be able to use a... <laughs> the not be able to... Yeah, yeah you can't see it. Too well, but. Um, what happens is that this is all the land in Hawaii, let's say. So I thought we have a lot of land to sell. Mm -hmm. But what happened is it's kind of like this. And what happens is that this is ag land. Mm -hmm. Let's see, it's 47%. Then you have uh, uh, conservation land, mm -hmm. which is 47%. Then you have urban land, which you can sell. And then you have, let me check. No, no, let's, let's, let's just get to the point. Okay, here. the got, point got, is yeah. you only can sell this amount of land. Right, but, but the thing is, of the people who are buying on this part of land, an awful lot of them are not from any of this land, right? They're from offshore. No, you cannot. They might be from offshore, uh -huh. but because there's no safeguards in place, they're able to do that right now. Are you proposing that we have more land available for housing? The You can go through the Land Use Commission and have them rezone mm -hmm. some land, but what happens if we keep on doing this, then you're going to run out of ag land. Right. So okay, because, so Jim, yeah. Jim Brewer, what do you think about the, the, we're talking about affordable housing specifically and targeting offshore investors. What do you think should happen? Well, uh, Frankly, is I think you have to tax them. I mean, uh, you, you just uh, specific targeted taxation. Right. Yeah, because uh, uh, you have to have a, a graduated tax, and when it starts getting up into the billions and whatnot, then uh, you really have to. Uh, it has to be bi a big tax. And then some of those people would then be discouraged from buying them. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Because uh, half of Native Hawaiians have been driven out of Hawaii because of. of uh, unaffordable housing. I, I would bring up and I, I want to I want to bring up a, a point. You know, uh, 12 years ago, Renee and Ng and I ran for governor and lieutenant governor. And this was our brochure that we used. And you know what? You go through it here and you see everything here. It's the same issues. It's the same stuff and nothing has been done about it. So this tells you that our legislature is in gridlock. It is it's it's a know nothing do nothing uh, thing. They do, they consume all kinds of things. I'll tell you one of the things we should do away with is campaign spending a uh, uh, thing because what we should have is every election would be uh, you know we could, let, fu let, funded funded publicly. Let, let's go back to that later on. Yeah, but uh, the point is, I, could I can I talk about this? Yeah, quickly. Affordable housing for all, lifetime health coverage, citizen investment for nothing less than high quality public education. Aloha Ana, develop food security and energy independence. 
rescue Hawaii's democracy from big money politics. All of these things okay. are still with us. Great. Okay. Andrea Tapola. I mean, do you, can you well, even disagree with what he said? I no, agree. no, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I think we all agree that something needs to change because if we didn't, then we wouldn't be running. And so I think one of the things that we saw, though, is in Kailua, there was an actual uh, fine that's being applied to some of these offshore investors that are doing these TVUs. One of these specifically, I won't say the name, a million dollars in fines mm -hmm. and still there, still renting out. So we really have to think deeply through this because at the end of the day, we need to make sure that what we're, we're suggesting be a policy actually make it where we are opening up more affordable housing for local families. Uh, okay, keep going with that theme. So what specifically would you propose that would increase the affordable quantity housing. Of, of affordable housing? Okay, well, besides, you know, mo opening up more market space by us making sure that local families are prioritized, we could also support more local developers because we have a lot of guys that are jumping in, uh, build building affordable housing at small quantities, not 13,000 a pop, but a couple here and there that are more community-minded where people can come in and live and work and play in those communities. But let's not forget, DHHL plays a big part of this too. DHHL is a housing agency within the state that last year built no houses, and so it could play play a big part in this equation as well. And so I think that's exactly under the governor's purview to set an accurate goal of how we could increase the housing supply there. I have a really good answer for that. Uh, we, uh, in doing our research, we found out that 75, uh, 50 to 75 percent of the cost of a house is the land beneath it. And the thing is that w we, the state, owns a lot of land. And so if we were to have, uh, have, have a house built on it that is only 25 percent of the cost of housing right now, they could, uh, we could have people who could, who could get a house. The land under belongs to the state and they, it's like leasehold land mm -hmm. and, uh, and you pay one dollar a month, uh, one, one dollar a year uh, uh, each year that you're there, but the point is and you have co-op housing and whatnot. Okay. And, and this, this could be very easily done. And, uh, but the only thing is, it's gonna, have to, it's, it's gonna have to be fitted in. And the thing is, I'm going to, uh, if elected governor, I am going to have what I call uh, citizen action roundtables. Okay. I, and we go a, into, we go on. Jim, hold it, that's a new subject. Let me, let me keep well, this a subject, and plus I've got questions this, coming in. Is this not the same subject? I'm and talking about roundtables. I'm is talking a generalized thing, right? Well, that's a generalized thing, but it's it's a thing about how that you actually attack these problems, and if the legislature won't do it, we'll do it with these citizen action okay, roundtables. Okay, good. All right. Uh, the idea of the free state land for housing. Do you agree with that? And uh, forgive me, don't use this. No. All right. Work. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, anyway, when you come to DHS um, for Hawaiian homes. The problem is that even if you give them the land, they cannot afford the homes. Oh, yeah. So right now, I saw something with Dr. Kelly and Peter Salvio talking about. If the Hawaiian people who meets the blood quantum can qualify for that home, if they can use the equity of the land to buy the home, if you lease for 99 years, you probably pay off that home already. And what you do is you take the equity out and you send your kids for education. You open your own business to empower the people wealth, yeah. mm -hmm. so that eventually the Hawaiian people will have the homes and be able to progress forward. Okay, let me, um, this is a specific question to uh, Andrea Topolo on the public, on the mention of Hawaiian homes. If you became governor, what would your administration do to expedite the process and place more Hawaiians on affordable housing homestead awards? A little more specifics on what you see Hawaiian homelands changing. Well, first off, I would commit to having an ombudsman in my office. Want somebody specifically dedicated to advocate for beneficiaries that are having problems with the department. We have various homesteads across the state, and very, a lot of their problems are very unique. Some of them in, in Puna are very unique to Puna. Some of them in Maui are unique to what's going on in Maui. And so what we need to talk about is the homesteads that are going, what type of infrastructure are they missing? Because some homesteads have been built, but no water. Some homesteads have been built, but no leases have been given out. And some homesteads are just land, but haven't been built on. So starting in each homestead and making sure to work more hand in hand with DHHL and the beneficiaries, but making sure that I'm directly involved in all of this. Because we can't keep saying, oh, we'll make a list, 44,000 on the list, and no specific goal of how no, many the, homes the, we're the, making. DHHL is, is run uh, by a commission. 
right? So appointed by the governor. Appointed by the governor, right? But I mean, is that a problem? And that it, it, it actually distills the accountability. The, the governor has not been held accountable for the lack of building on on Hawaiian homelands, right? Right. I mean, and the commissioners are supposed to represent the beneficiaries, and what the beneficiaries are crying out is that they don't feel like they're being represented. And so, in the event that we do need to figure out this relationship better, so we can hear the beneficiaries' voice for those who are being evicted, which in some cases they are, how do we get them to stay on the land in some areas where they don't have any infrastructure? I think that what I'm kind of asking though too is how do you invest to build, to really put it on steroids? I mean, right now right. you've got a long wait list right. and, and, and individual disputes and a lot of time is, is used figuring out if people are really, truly beneficiaries and all this stuff. There's a lot of bureaucracy associated with it. Do, what do you see doing to actually get them to put a lot more units? I mean, do you want them to do multifamily? Do you want to change the lease conditions so you can have a lot more people living on less property? Well, I think that some of the affordable housing solutions can go right into that because the price of the houses, like Terrence said, that's an issue. I have people that can't qualify for the loan. So we need to make sure that we're building houses that are affordable and not just building them and then hoping somebody can qualify for a $500,000 house that's not going to be affordable for someone who's been waiting on the list for years. So it's a combination of using affordable housing solutions and then being more hands-on with the department and with the beneficiaries. Um, back to the question, though. Uh, what does it... For the rest of us, the non-Hawaiian population, where where is the solution? What, what do you think, Jim? Well, the thing is, uh, f for Hawaiian and non-Hawaiian, the the whole point is that if you take it seriously, what I just said about the land is the is the cost, and if it's government land, then the government can just have le have that leasehold charge one dollar a year so it'd be and a, and for a house instead of costing five hundred thousand dollars would be one third that okay let me um, I've got a good question from a viewer um, yeah. back to our cost of living questions would the candidates and I think Terence I think you said you would support this already would the candidates support removing the excise tax on food says or medicine food and medicine uh, Andrew Tapola I've proposed it every year that I've been a legislator then then how do you how do you cover the loss of money Oh, we have lots of special funds that we haven't been taking care of. We have tax credits that should have been sunsetted. We have contracts that we give out that nobody does the work for. We have vacant properties that the state hasn't collected any lease rent on. There's a lot of waste. So let's go through the waste and then figure out what we can do to better utilize the money, the taxpayers' dollars. Is there a feeling on, uh, among the three of you that the, the tax system, as it is applied to individuals and across the excise tax, is fair? I mean, are we taxing rich people enough and poor people too much? What do you think? I think it has to be a balance, and that's why I really want to have a audit done on all departments. Mm. Well, like anything else, you know, mm -hmm. if you buy a home or a race car, you have to check to make sure that each department has a full range of motion. And if you don't have a full range of motion, you have to find out, well, why don't you have it? There's kind of a lot of audits that goes on now. I mean, don't you? But people don't listen to the audits. I, I would agree with that. We <laughs> have so many audits that people haven't people opened up listen. and read. Well, yes. the thing about uh, tax uh, right now, I mean, what we've had here is a very regressive tax on everyday people. In other words, the uh, you go to uh, the Long's tax. Drug Store. Yeah, the, the excise, the, that excise tax. And the thing is that... Uh, that hits poor people the worst. And, uh, and the thing is that the, uh, we, we have, uh, like, I, I, I've gone down to the legislature for years and years, and here comes the uh, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And who is the Tax Foundation of Hawaii? <coughs> if you look up and find out who they are, they're part of the big boys on Bishop Street. Let me, um, and the thing is okay. that the tax that we have, too, uh, on income tax on the wealthy in Hawaii only goes to 11 percent. It goes down to 10 sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, look, uh, that's what, how we got out of the Great Depression. After the Great Depression, you know, they took the, uh, uh, the uh, national income tax up to 94 percent. Okay, so Terrence, go ahead. So I always talk to people about that. So you're saying 
that because I work two jobs and I make more money, I should be get I should get taxed more. I, I don't really agree. I didn't with that. say that. Well, it seems like. Why? It. Why would I? Why would that be? If because you if you work two more jobs, right? How? Why would you be uh, paying more tax? Uh, you more income. Income. You're making yeah, more income. Yeah, because you're making more. People think I'm rich, but a lot of it goes to taxes. And the reason why we have high taxes. What do you mean? You would be paying this uh, uh, the same? You be paying no, the I same? No, I don't. Right? I pay a lot of tax. Well, the thing is, though, is that if you if you make more money. Then that money is taxed. Well, last year I held a tax conference and you know, I, I mean, worked with tax the, experts what? across the nation. And one of the biggest things when you do tax reform for any state is you have to have a clear vision. So whenever you do tax reform, you have to have a vision, which I believe the vision for our state should be that all of our decisions should base around how we can keep more local families here for generations to come. Then you look through your tax structure, whether it's income, whether it's the TAT, whether it's the general excise, whether it's property, and then you do your tax reform and structure it to get to your, your end goal. And I think that's what we've been missing is that we don't have a clear vision of where we're going. So taxation is based upon whatever the policy point is at that time at the table. Yeah, and, and the thing is that th that, uh, that uh, sir, the, the way you would judge it, is not going to come from the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Okay. It's going to come from the governor and, and his, his cabinet and whatnot and, and the people because the thing is uh, we have to tax the people who have the money. Okay, let me just say one, one more thing for, uh, for Andrew Tupola. On that point, you've been in the legislature for four years. Uh, you've seen all the decisions that were made about finances and taxes. Do you think that there's any group in Hawaii that's not paying enough taxes? Um, I think right now everyone feels overtaxed. Businesses feel overtaxed. Individuals feel overtaxed. Families, Hawaiians, any ethnicity you talk to, they feel overtaxed. So really when we look at that's this... That's how they feel. Right. Well, because everyone feels the burden of how much it costs to just buy bread and milk and mm -hmm. excise tax taxes the businesses who then raise their goods prices. We don't have sales tax, which actually is for the customer. So long story short, I believe that in our taxation, we should go back to waste because we're always looking for more money when really how much money do we leave on the table? How much federal funds have we given back to the government and that we walk away from in the Department of Education at Nahasda with DHHL? We've left so much out there and we haven't been collecting from those people who do owe and all of those fines that should be enforced, but yet we're still out there looking for more, more money. The HASDA is the Highway Administration. No, no, no. This is for Department of Hawaiian Homelands. This oh, is the okay. money for um, natives. Okay. Um, okay, so another viewer question. Which candidates are in favor of raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour? Terrence, you first. Um, <clears throat> I'm not for raising the wages to $15, only because... <clears throat> If people who specialize in other jobs, they're going to feel that because the, the minimum wage is getting close to what I make right now, then pretty soon it'll start a avalanche and everybody's going to ask him for more money. Um, I think what we're not looking at is we keep on looking at taxes, but we need to look at how we can bring more income into the state, whether it's legalized shipboard gambling, because that way it doesn't tax our infrastructure, a lottery. Now, I'm not seeing. I tell you what, gambling and stuff is not the answer to a problem. It I is can tell you, it, a it, bring, pilot it, bring, program. it brings more problems than it ever solves. Well, right now, you're going to tax everyone here because we have nothing. What about the what industrial? Do what do you mean? I checked uh, on the industrial. What do you mean? Hand. I'm going to. I'm going to tax people who Jim, have nothing. Jim, let, me, let him finish his sentence. Yeah. Yeah, we need to make sure that a lot of bills that go through get don't implemented. Get gut in, gut and replace. They need to be implemented because overall the monies that come in from the outside is the ones that are going to keep the taxes low so people in the government don't look at ways to you, You're talking money. about the tourist money. Is that what you're talking um, about? That's part I'll of it. I'll tell you what, we got too many tourists. Okay, now we're going to yeah. move into some more subjects based on that we want to talk about. Uh, so let me, um, this is a question that came in from a viewer. I'm trying to make sure we honor the viewers and their questions here. Uh, this says for Representative Topola, but I think this is something that all of you can bite on. Questions here. Why can you explain your position on climate change and your plans to mitigate it here in Hawaii, Representative? 
Well, I think, you know, in regards to the hurricanes, we talked a lot about whether or not Hawaii is emergency ready. You know, at the beginning of the year when we had that missile scare, of course, we had every emergency department in front of our committees saying, where are we at? Where are supplies? If this really happened, how many shelters do we have? And so I think in talking about what's going on with all of these hurricanes, people are still concerned that we don't have enough shelters, that there's not enough state buildings that are hurricane ready or disaster proof. And as well, do we have enough of a communication system and do we have enough supplies for our neighbor islanders? That came up in one of the hearings and it was disheartening to hear that we don't have as many supplies on the neighbor islands but that everything is centralized here in Oahu. We need to make sure to get our communities ready for erosion, for hurricanes, for things that are happening that we have no control over but we do have control over how prepared we are. Um, just, to, just to focus in on the, on the question itself though on climate change, uh, at Hawaii News Now today, we did a story with a dramatic erosion on uh, Ehukai Beach. Oh, yeah. Like houses with their, their yards are gone. Um, it seems, do you, first of all, do you all believe that global climate change is actually happening? And secondly, how do you, how does the island adjust? Do we just move people back or do we harden the shorelines? Or what do you think about that? Well, I do think that climates are changing. I think that obviously the erosion isn't just there, but all along when you drive towards the North Shore, roads are falling into the water. There are ways, I think, for us to better prepare our seas and our oceans, but a lot of them are cultural ways. Many islands have gone through this through erosion. Some of them have reef atolls that protect the outsides that make it where the, the water doesn't hit the coast as much, but we always revert to sandbags or sea or things that actually make the problem worse. So I think that we need it. I think implement more natural and cultural solutions that have been used in the past for centuries. Jim, climate change for you? Well, the thing is with, with climate change is uh, what don't, why don't we also feel like that we have to do some prevention? H how about turning it back? How about stopping it and why not? Uh, we like uh, reducing emissions. Yes. In other words, what, what we do is we have to figure out how to get the cars off the road. That's basically what we have to do. And the thing is that Obama's solution was to uh, 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 get to save the economy, was to get Detroit up on its feet again, uh, building autos that are going to be compl uh, completing, uh, completely, uh, I mean, you know, the air, yeah. why, 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 didn't, why wasn't it done with electrical vehicles and okay. whatnot? Okay, See, Paris, this, this your, your feeling about what to do about climate change. Well, climate change, apparently, if you look, it's affecting the whole world. Uh, there's a very large water shortage in a lot of places in California, uh, some of the European countries. Uh, we have a limited water supply. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that because you turn on the shower and it's on, you turn on the water, it's on. But, you know, we already have that 27,000 gallons of jet fuel that leaked up Red Hill. Now, what are you doing about that water? Every mm -hmm. single water here on the island is very precious because it has to go to the aquifer. I've seen water water supply commercials that it takes approximately 20, 27 years before it goes back and we get to use it. We use 66 million gallons of water a day. How are we putting it back? So for us, I believe we need to do something to protect the resources that we have because it's very limited. So I believe the last debate, Ray LaRue brought up the um, geotextile tubing, which I looked into it, and that's a way to change the currents that's underneath the ocean so that it doesn't erode our land. I believe something like that, that you know, helps the technology. environment. Technology can be done, and we need to do it right away. Back in the 70s, this was not happening. And then, of course, roads was a lot better. Well, it was, I think, but we just didn't know it. <laughs> oh, I've been looking. It, it's really bad now. OK, um, um, I got a number of questions here that I have to uh, respect uh, that are specific, kind of specific to uh, Representative Tupola and her Republican candidacy. But you guys could pitch in on this if you want. Um, First of all, uh, Representative Tupola, do you believe that President Trump has a strong moral compass? Do you le believe he's taking the nation in the right direction? Um, I support the president. You know, I don't support all of his actions and maybe some of his statements, but I think that the leaders of our state, of our country, need to be supported just like we would want to if elected. I don't get to choose who I work with, I get to choose how I work with them. And I try to work well with everyone. And I think in this position, we need to work well with the federal government all the way down to the county government to get things so that we can keep more local families here. All the resources we need. Um, okay, but just specifically on the moral compass question. Yeah, I think, you know, This man has no moral compass. This man is totally self-centered. 
and actually uh, we may be much better off with him than we would w with his successor Pence if he if he's bumped out uh, Pence is even scarier than him because Pence is better organized and whatnot uh, uh, this guy is just all over the place and he's um, uh, so many uh, psychological uh, people, psychiatrists and whatnot, say the guy is just a total, I mean, he's, he is the characteristic of what is wrong with our country. He, okay. he is a greedy, bully, self-centered maniac. Let me get Terrence's opinion. Well, I'm looking at how the economy is going and jobs, um, <clears throat> it all seems to be working fine. Um, being oriental, it, does, it kind of rubs me the wrong way because we've always been humble and quiet and we don't want attention when we accomplish something very large. Um, this is like totally different. But like Andrea said, I believe that everyone just needs to work together and do away with the personality side. We have a job to do. Oh yeah, well the thing is that personality though, you know, if, if, a, if a person is a criminal, that's not a personality problem. That's a crime problem. Okay, let me give, Andrew, do you want to uh, respond to what? Uh, well, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, if we make everything about ourselves, our posturing, our disagreements with others, then we can't push things forward for Hawaii. We are going to have a short amount of time to try to create the biggest amount of impact. And that's going to come from working with people that we like, that we don't like, that we agree with, that we don't agree with, and we have to constantly find ways to push forward. And, and we're that's what I've tried to do in the legislature we're gonna as have well. To, we're going to have to work here in Hawaii because uh, we're not going to get it from up there. Okay. Uh, because right now they have just hurt this. There's more people going to be homeless because of this big tax break that he gave to the, the a big majority of the people. The little bit's coming down to us and we only get it for seven years and those big monies on uh, Bishop Street and, Mar and Wall Street, they're going to be getting big bucks forever. Okay, so and let me... they already got more money than they know what to do with. We've got, we got more calls coming in and I want to make sure that we, we, we follow up. The education, uh, we haven't talked much about education. Uh, specifically, what is your status on raises for teachers and funding for education? I think we should. I think that if we don't value our teachers, then people will not enter the profession. We have had some permanent subs, some of them going the entire school year. And I think this past year, the stat was 144 teachers that left. It might have been up to 400, but when it came out, it basically gave us the, the knowledge that we are not valuing our teachers. You know, you, you said earlier that you, I believe you said you don't support the constitutional amendment because the language is so vague and can mm. be used for almost any way you, they wanted to. Um, how would you find money to pay teachers? Well, I think with the department getting, I think this last budget was $1.9 billion. We really have to, like Terrence always says, audit through. We've talked about it many times. Why is the money getting stuck up in the admin? It doesn't come down to the schools. Why with a 1.9 budget, which sometimes is close to half of the state budget, do we still not have enough to pay teachers or do we still not have enough to repair our schools? And it goes back to where are we spending the money? Is it too much admin cost and not enough for the weighted student formula? Not enough for teacher salaries? Well, then that needs to be adjusted. Just, just to, you know, just to be specific here. Um, I mean, you've been in the legislature for four years. You've seen that budget come through. Yes. Do you, do you think that there's enough money in the DOE budget to provide raises for teachers to the extent that it would make a difference? Yes. Okay, well, I would say if we uh, were to the top uh, uh, tax uh, that uh, the, the wealthy pay here is 11 percent, I think if we went up to 22 percent and funded this uh, thing, it would be good. And what they found... There's another thing that I'm concerned about because I've been known for, for years as a person who did, uh, did so uh, a lot for the homeless and, and, and getting uh, people uh, jobs and things like this. But the thing is that on this subject right here, what I would like to see is um, a specific program that would save money and and, and give more money, in other words, it'll save money which could be better distributed within the Department of Education. Okay, and um, that is this, is that they've experimented with this in various places, I know in Camden, New Jersey. They took kids who were in the very poorest families and they put them with a teacher who, uh, starting at age, I mean, age three, and all the way to the third grade that person stayed with them and was like a 
like a, uh, a, mentor a, second, a second mother, basically. Mm -hmm. And after that, ha when that happened, those kids came out of there and they were on par with the best schools. Interesting idea. Let me, let me, and Terrence, give me a chance to weigh in on this. Do you think that there's enough money within the Department of Education to give teachers a significant a, a raise? Oh, uh, well, like Ms. Topola said, I would have to look more into it because I don't have the experience that she has. Let me, let me throw out one more question. I'm trying to move this along because sure. we, literally we've, we've got through 40 minutes already. That's how fast But the thing I just described Jim, saved Jim, money. Jim? It saved a lot of money. Okay, no, I understand that. And I said it's a, it's a decent idea. So, but, one of the things that I've heard recently is that within the Department of Education, there's an equity issue, that they are not spending enough money on the poorer parts of the island and probably spending, because they claim to be equal across right, wow. all lines. You know, do you think that there, there should be more money spent in the more rural, more poverty areas uh, and, and maybe move some of that money from the higher income areas where they have a lot better achievement in schools. Well, we've talked about how when, at the legislature the weighted student formula is supposedly equal, but when you're farther from resources, you need more money. You go to school in Molokai, you don't get to play sports there. You have to fly. You go to school on another island, you might not have the right teachers. They fly them in. The principal for Kilohana and Molokai is married to the vice principal of Maui. They have to fly every weekend to see each other. And this is part of the canoe district, which is those three islands. But in order for us you know, to really understand what needs to happen, we, we really have to look deeper into if that's equitable, because right now charter school kids only get 7,000 per pupil, public at 12, where do we come up with that that's equitable? And everyone says, well, it's because they don't have buildings, so they don't have as much to, to maintain. So if they don't have buildings, then... What kind of school do they have? Yeah. So at the end of the day, I, I do not think that it's equitable, and I think we need to look into the disparity for rural areas, underserved areas, as well as the remote locations of some of our schools that are far from resources and other schools that are close to resources. But you're saying all that within the current budget as much as possible. Right, right. Um, another subject that our audience is interested in, doctors. Very recently we saw how oh. many doctors are leaving, yeah. how particularly rural areas don't even have access to specialists. Um, what do you think, Jim, I'll let you go after this one first. Uh, if you could keep your answer as short as you can, I'd yeah. really appreciate it. What do you think we should do to keep, get, keep doctors here? You mentioned a single payer system. Do you think we need to revamp the whole medical care system? Exactly, because uh, if we go to single payer, uh, we will save uh, one third to uh, one half of the cost of, uh, of health care, and everybody will be covered from birth to death. Uh, this program, I, I, I submitted a bill uh, I think it was 10 years ago, and it, it's it's for uh, it would cover every everybody, and it's uh, that's what they do in Canada. Is your feeling that that money, um, if saved, could then be recycled to keep the doctors in town? It definitely. And improve I mean, their sure, because actually, you know what drives doctors out is that every one, every uh, insurance company has different things, and they have to go to school some of them for two two solid weeks to to figure out how each company. Uh, how, to, how to fill out all their papers mm -hmm. and uh, whatnot. Terrence, your, your thoughts about I that? I believe you have to find some kind of incentive to keep the doctors here or else... Well, that would be an incentive because they, they can end up uh, serving their patients. You yeah. know, I think that if, you know, we have these colleges and the students go to the schools, it would be great if they actually have hands-on here so that when they finish yep. their school, yep. they can have hands-on. Can't disagree. And I do definitely believe that you know, our kids sit in classrooms for six hours a day. And in this age, I think we should incorporate internet because once you have curiosity, then you can find passion. And once you turn that passion into obsession, you don't have to depend on the kid to study. He's gonna read everything and they, we want them to have jobs. We don't want them to just have jobs. We want them to have careers because a job is getting paid for something you don't like to do. Okay, Dr. Shortage. Uh, there is an incentive program. It's called a loan repayment program. So I think it's SB 819, but we were, I was a big advocate of it because the loan. So that exists? Yeah, okay. so the loan repayment program actually grows the doctors here because when you go to school here, you're able to utilize that money. The state puts up X amount and the feds match it dollar for dollar. But if you take advantage of it, you can only get your loans repaid if you serve as a doctor in a rural area. You know, so, well, let me uh, let me take Jim Brewer's suggestion, and it's a kind of it's a fairly widely held suggestion. A single payer health care system. Do you think that that would work in Hawaii? Yeah, I mean, I think you know we had a really good system going on for the past couple of years. We had things that worked well. I think definitely people have suggested that we return back. So, 
I, I don't think I've ever heard a Republican say they support a single payer health care system. Well, I mean, again, prior to what we've currently had a, with the Affordable Care Act, we had certain things that people were agreeable to in Hawaii as far as it working because we've talked Pre-paid about health care. Yeah. Okay. We talked about it in the health committee many times, which was what was working well in Hawaii. Let's go with what was working well because now we've expended all this money trying to make the health connector lost out on millions and now we're trying to return back to what was already working. Okay. Um, this is another very important issue uh, and I appreciate our audience for, for calling in all these things. How will you improve our business climate? Workers comp, taxes, regulations, uh, uh, Terrence, Taria, what, what do you think is the number one thing that could improve our business climate here? Well, everyone here always talks about <clears throat> regulations, so we need to look into these regulations and see if it's excessive. Um, businesses here already have a hard time, as you've read all over in the papers or even on the Internet, <clears throat> that they're having a hard time. Uh, probably a lot of it is for taxation, some of it is for regulation. So I think as we look deeper into these businesses, we can find out more Andrea might have uh, a little more experience on that because she sees everything for the past four years. I haven't seen anything. Everything that I have requires an audit because I need to look to see what's going on. So for me, I really want to make sure that we follow what they say because if we do nothing, we have nothing. Jim, do you um, agree that the business climate is poor here? And and what in a green platform or your platform would actually make things better for business? I think that the whole economic uh, uh, system in Hawaii is kab uh, kabakahi. And uh, this, uh, what, we, uh, what we need to do is we need to tax the wealthy. The wealthy are doing, in other words, well, let me ask you, this you, you don't, you don't, you don't cut off. This is businesses, right? Yeah, this is, you know, no, but let me ask this question. So if, if you tax the wealthy, how does that, help the business climate. That's what the question was. How do we improve the business climate? Do we need what it, to what it does? Uh, what it does is it gives people money to spend. And, the, and you, 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 you put money into the economy. Because right now what all these guys are doing is they're hanging on to their money and you see we're in gridlock. Nothing is moving forward. We are in gridlock. This legislature, like I said, they haven't done anything for 12 years. Okay, so uh, business climate your own thoughts? Um, well, I represent Campbell Industrial, so I work with a lot of industrial businesses. I work with small businesses, restaurants. We have actually the only two landfills are in my district. I have HECO in my district. So when I work with business to business, all of their needs are different. For some of the small businesses, they have the struggle of brick and mortar, paying their rents. Maybe if they're trying to build something, the delays of the permitting time, as you know, here in Hawaii, we have the longest delay of permitting time in the nation at 17 months sometimes that it takes to get a permit. For the larger um, companies like industries, some of them have come to me with a lot of problems with the state because they need to get the permits to do the work that they need. And then others have come forward and said, we don't have enough vocational training, meaning streamlines of training that will get them enough guys on the line to work so that they can keep their business running. So lots of different ones, depending on if you're talking about a large industrial scale business all the way down to a small mom and pop store, which I think um, small mom and pops are trying to come together to save costs by using shared spaces, shared marketing tools. Let so me that ask this just survive. to focus a little bit. I mean, you say a lot of things, but you know, generally speaking, our legislature certainly isn't capable of doing more than one or two big things in a year. So what do you think would be the one or two things you'd come in with first with regard to the business climate? Uh, permitting times, gotta start with that. We, we, tr we talked about it this year, and it's not just for construction industry, industries, it's all across the board. But it's a county function for the most part. How yeah. do you help them from the state side? Well, when we talked about it, we talked about mandating it so that it would push the county into complying with something because we could try to continue to fund them, but if they had a mandated time, then we could at least enforce it within the counties and maybe I guess apply some type of fine if it's not given by a certain time, which would make them expedite it because across the counties, not just ours, everybody says that's their number one reason. Okay, so another viewer, so this is somebody that drives me crazy driving in all the way from Makakilo, is what would you do to support the repair and modernization of our infrastructure? They mentioned airport schools, buildings, I'm thinking about roads and uh, bridges. I mean, what do you, what do you folks think? What, what do we have to do to make, I mean, it seems like things are falling apart. Well, I think we need to get uh, uh, cars and, and trucks off the road. I mean, we uh, the ones that are burning fossil fuels. So my electric car is good. Yes, exactly. Uh, you have an electric car? Yeah, but let's not get off this. Okay, but, to, okay, but the, the, whole, the whole point, though, 
is this, is that if we don't start becoming part of the solution, if we just sit here and say we're going to keep polluting and we're going to have to uh, accommodate our uh, more flooding, uh, actually it seems like that uh, that uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hurricane things are moving forward and we are maybe going to be in a hurricane alley so how do we, how next do we, year how and do we, year how after that. How do we that. fix the roads and so on? You said get the cars off. Or that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's what happens. It wears them out. I okay. mean, you see it every day. Okay, Terrence, your turn. And, and that's what I understand with our crumbling infrastructure. How can we have this big rail project keep on going on right. when we could have used the money to fix the infrastructure? Yeah. How many water mains have you heard broke? A lot. Right. Exactly. How many roads are crumbling and falling in the ocean? A lot. Exactly. Our schools are all falling apart. Yeah. So I, more I see this rail keep on going and billions of dollars. You know, I work for the bus. So why didn't they stop at Pearl City where we have a Pearl City bus yard? Now they want to come to Middle Street, which is fine because we have the center right there. Okay, Andrea Tapola on infrastructure improvements. Uh, the first thing that's coming to mind is don't leave any more federal dollars on the table. We've talked about this in all of our departments, but specifically in the Department of Transportation, there was a lot of delays where we did have to return some of the federal funds. Some of it, the backlog got fixed, but I think when we're talking about DOT airports, we've got to realize that almost all of our funds for that come federally. So we need to expedite our projects when the monies come in, quickly implement them into projects so that we don't have to go back and say, ah, we can't fix that because the money's lapsed, so we've got to try again next year. It seems like a simple solution, but it's something that's held back many of our departments within transportation. Do you think it's a matter of competence? I mean, it's been, I mean, I, we, you, you could say that we need to do this better, but then how do you get it to do it better without changing the people who are doing it? Well, that's part of the solution. I think another part of the solution is making sure that when we implement these, that like I said, with delays in permitting, that all happens when we, like for example, on Farrington High, we, we had that, a very short project that took so long, in fact, it took almost four years to complete for a couple mile, I think it was a 1.5 mile stretch. But when they dug down inside, there wasn't enough maps for the lines underneath the roads. They didn't have enough wherewith of how deep they should dig. They had to keep redoing it. So it's a combination of many things. I think over the years, people have been very lackadaisical about writing the correct maps when they lay lines under, because it's AT&T, it's HECO, it's HELCO. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that touch underneath these roads. As soon as you dig and you try to expand, that's when you find out where everything is. Well, since we're talking about the competence of state government. I've got two questions here um, about uh, the, the, the decision of uh, Governor Egan not to join us tonight. Um, but I'd like to start and give you all an opportunity. What do you think the governor has done, right or wrong? I've only got about three minutes, so I need like 30 seconds from each of you. Jim, what is, it, is the biggest issue you have with Governor Ige? Well, I think, uh, I think he's uh, in, in, the, in the, the paradigm that we have now where it's all locked up. I think he's kind of more progressive than what we've had before. Okay, uh, Terrence? Yes, in the past year he's become very progressive. When he first got elected. You mean as, politically progressive? Um, action progressive. He'd been actually trying to do things, but the first two years he was so quiet and now the last two years it's like, well, he's trying to do something, but it's almost like running in place. Uh, we need forward movement and I think four years is enough time to have forward movement to improve the quality of living in Hawaii and I just haven't seen that. Okay, Andrew? I think I've I really haven't seen enough of a vision. Where where are we going? For the past four years, I've seen the state tack back and forth with different initiatives like, oh, we're going to double food production. Where did that go? We don't know. Oh, we're going to do this now. Where, where are we going? And then within each of the departments, again, because I sit on different committees, we've had the hardest time trying to make forward progress with different uh, department chairs changing, with different in, uh, employees changing, different processes changing, and so I think just... Do they have consistent messaging between departments? No, we've had the hardest time, like even when we call people forward, w let's take the food, double, du doubling food production. When we spoke with the Department of Agriculture chair, we asked, where are we at with this? And they said, we don't even know how much food we produce. This wasn't our goal, so we're trying to figure it out. Same thing with the Aircon. They kind of made their own goal, then later the Department of Education had to kind of run and try to catch up with it because they didn't have that as their goal and they had to quickly try to see if they could implement it. So I think cohesion within the departments, a clear vision for the last four years is what we've been lacking and what we need to make marked progress and larger than just a few houses or, okay, we'll get back to you on Hawaiian homes. We didn't get any done in the last four, maybe later. 
We have to be able to make timelines and clear benchmarks and then report back and give some accountability to the people. Let me ask all three of you, and this is the last question. Um, the, 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 this issue of debate, do you think that the governor should have been here tonight, Jim? I think he should have been, but the thing is, um, I'm glad I'm here because I'm telling, I'm telling you, we have to uh, get the uh, wealthy here to pay the price of paradise because the, uh, the, the half of Hawaiians have paid the price of paradise by having to move out. We want to move them back. And I'll tell you, you're not gonna do it until you're willing to, to, to give, like my uh, citizen action round tables. We're going to come, we will come up with solutions and we will force the legislature. Okay, good. To do I need to job. give the other two a chance, real quick. Got like 15 um, seconds. I don't think that um, it mattered that he's here because his table is already set. Um, I, I'm glad all of us are here because I want people to hear what other plans that's available. This is going to be an ongoing issue in this campaign. How important do you think it is for the governor to come out and debate? Very important. And, and why? because people deserve to know what's gonna happen for the next four years. If you are happy about it or if you're unhappy about it, it doesn't matter. There's another four years ahead of the next governor and we want to know what the plans are specifically and for each community and county. Would you pledge if you were elected to debate in every primary and every general election that you face? Yes. Okay. Debate. If I, if I, anyway, I'm if, getting a wrap, I have to stop. If, if, I would, if, I, if I'm elected, we will dig out okay. and we'll just bring those yes, people back. Yes, so thank you everyone very much. Mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight and we thank our guests, nonpartisan candidate Terrence Teruya, Republican candidate Andrea Topola, and Green Party candidate Jim Brewer. Join us next week as we feature the candidates in the runoffs for two neighbor island mayoral races. For Maui County, former Maui Councilman Mike Victorino will face current council member Ellie Cochran. That's at 8 p.m. Then at 8.30, this is all next week, we'll hear from Kauai County Council members Derek Kalkami and Mel Raposo, who each want to become Kauai's. Until then, I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Uh, hui ho. Broadcasts of Insights on PBS Hawaii are made possible by the support of viewers like you. Mahalo and bye. St. Francis Healthcare System, following in the footsteps of the Sisters of St. Francis to create healthy communities in Hawaii. Carl Smith Ball, providing legal services throughout Hawaii and the Pacific since 1857, making a positive difference in the communities where we live and work. Waikiki Health. Our mission is to provide quality medical and social services that are accessible and affordable for everyone, regardless of ability to pay.